Welcome into the Action Network podcast. We are presented by FanDuel Sportsbook. I'm your host, Brendan Glasheen, joined by Sean Zarillo, Billy Ward. You know what that means. UFC betting preview. We're on to UFC fight night. San Antonio going down at the AT&T Center on Saturday night. Looking at our favorite underdogs, props, and more. We'll finish with best bets. Of course, as we always do, we start with the main event, Marlon Vera, Corey Sandhagen is the matchup for uh, the main event this coming weekend. Vera plus 138 on the money line. Sandhagen, the favorite, minus 170. Goes down at 930. Zarillo, what do we make of the matchup and how do we want to bet it? Yeah, this is a tremendous fight. More exciting than last week's main event, even though last week was for the welterweight championship. 135, in my opinion, the strongest division in MMA, top to bottom across all organizations, and my favorite division to watch. Shida Vera, Corey Sanhagen getting close to a title shot here. This matchup will go a long way towards determining who may get that shot down the line. This should be a high-paced war. Both guys are super durable. That's why you see the total, the fight to go to decision, juice to the over or around a pick em price, even though this should be very high-paced. And in a normal fight, between two guys fighting at this pace, you would eventually expect somebody to get finished, but I don't necessarily think that's going to be the case here. Both guys are extremely durable. I think the likeliest finish is probably uh, Cheeto via submission because we've seen Corey get submitted on the ground in the past. I think that is the weakest defensively that either of the two fighters are in any particular area in terms of durability or submission defense. So Cheeto by submission, I think, is your likeliest path to finish here. The way I would go about betting the fight is Cheeto live after round one. Typically a slow starter, tends to build into his fights the longer he goes. With Corey Sandhagen, we've seen him in a few five-round fights where he started out fast, won the early rounds, and then eventually faded in the later rounds. Didn't have a big cardio drop-off, but I did think his effectiveness dropped off just a touch in the later rounds, enough where Cheeto, as he's building into the fight, should eventually take over late and win the later rounds. This is going to be a fight between Cheeto's moments against Corey's minutes. This is something I talk about all the time with Cheeto Bear's fights, but he tends to get outstruck by his opponents, loses on volume, and then he'll land the biggest punch of the round, wobble his opponent, and usually steal the round. So Cheeto is a very difficult guy to handicap because of that. The stats don't like him nearly as much as visually when you watch him. He is impressive because of the way he sort of controls the pace of its fights, controls the distance, ramps up, and then hurts his opponents, puts damage on them. His face is also just like made of Teflon. He never wears damage. And to the judges for optics, that's really important because Corey is going to one who is going to be the one who looks worse for wear at the end of the rounds and at the end of the fight. So I think if you want to justify Corey Sandhagen's favoritism here, you need him to hit takedowns and grapple successfully for minutes of this fight and get control time in order to secure more minutes. But if this fight goes to a decision, I'm expecting a razor close decision from the judges. So Cheeto at six to one by decision plus 300 for a same game parlay with Cheeto in the over two and a half rounds. Billy's going to give you a same similar angle there as well. So any angle with Cheeto in the fight going longer Cheeto by decision, my favorite ways to play this fight. In addition to a live bet after round one, Billy, they are both worthy wrestlers, but two, two different styles, right? Sanhagen more uh, creative in his attacks. And then you've got, uh, Vera, who's got a, a kickboxing element to his style. Yeah, you know, Cheeto Vera is almost a perfect storm for these late props that we talk about. He really likes to set up leg kicks, especially early in the fight, which, as we all know, pays dividends later on, right? You're not going to knock a guy out with one leg kick, but the 15th, 20th, whatever, you know, you get to the third, fourth round, those really add up. He also has a little bit of that uh, Peter Yan in him where he's willing to give up that first round just to kind of see what's going on, feel it out you know, work for winning down the stretch rather than right away, which I don't like when guys do that in three round fights, but in five round fights, you're giving up one of the five, you know, for paying dividends later on really like that angle for him. And that's why he's two and oh in fights that have made it past the third round. You know, every time he goes to the championship rounds, he's eventually won. Sandhagen is one and two in fights that have gone out of the three rounds. Obviously there's some differences in the level of competition with Sandhagen, you know, fighting title holders and whatnot, But I still think that's telling as to how these guys are going to fight and where their strengths are. So as Sean alluded to, I'm looking at Vera in the fourth, fifth, or decision. You get all three of those options at FanDuel at plus 330. Very similar to the over two and a half. You know, you're getting a slightly better price to give up the last half of the third round 
But I think if Cheeto is to win this, it's going to happen late. I wouldn't be surprised by a late stoppage, maybe by leg kicks like he's done in the past. But decision is probably, you know, where you're getting the most bang for your buck on that. But I'm willing to take a little bit worse odds just so I get fourth and fifth round finishes in there. Billy, I'm just curious, if this goes to a decision, if we knew it was going to a decision, guarantee going into the fight, where would you put Corey? 55%, 60%? Honestly, I think I might favor Cheeto just because of the five-round. Like, yeah. I'm going to be pretty confident that it's Cheeto close. wins fourth and fifth rounds, right? So if he can get one of the first three, he should probably be a favorite here. That's a big if, though, as you yeah. You know, it's just, it's purely just the odds discrepancy. Like, I think we both see it being razor close if it goes five rounds. And the odds suggest that Corey is much more likely to win a decision. So I think that's why we're we're both leaning Cheeto. We see much more decision equity on his side than the market's giving him credit for. Yeah, for sure. You can also read actionnetwork.com. Uh, Billy Ward has a UFC San Antonio luck ratings article out. He's been doing that for every fight. And uh, one of the first things he hits on the main event He's got Vera undervalued for the coming weekend. But as these guys mentioned, it's not necessarily uh, the money line play, but it's getting involved in the fight once it uh, is underway. After and, round and one. Real quick on that one. The whole thesis on him being undervalued is because it's a five round fight. I think these odds are spot on if it were a three round fight, but I like Vera late and I like his cardio and all those things. So kind of all plays into where Zarillo seeing it, what I'm seeing, it all points the same direction. Yeah, Corey Sandhagen can beat Song Dong in a five-round fight, but the way that fight was trending at the end, I had Corey, and I was getting a little nervous that Song was going to take over late and win the final two rounds, lost by a cut stoppage. Cheeto fought Song in a three-round fight, got started slow, didn't win the second round because he got going a little bit too late and lost the close decision. So just like in terms of how those five-round fights would have played out, I think Cheeto wins a five-round fight versus Song. I think Corey probably would have lost a five-round fight versus Song. So just a little bit of trajectories that we would view these fighters differently if they had those different marks on their records as well. And there's, there are some doubts about Sandhagen being an elite fighter. And I think for, for the long haul, uh, there are, there are ways you can get in on, uh, on, on Perez as we just, uh, or part of me on uh, Vera, as we just discussed, we'll get to Perez in a little bit. Okay. On to our favorite underdog plays for the weekend. So Vera's a dog, but that's not a dog we're eyeing. And just as a reminder, there are 12 fights this weekend. One fight was canceled. So 12 fights, six on the main card, six prelim fights. Sean Zarello, where do you see value for underdogs? I like Trey Ogden about plus 135. I don't like being in a spot where I'm backing a guy who was outstruck by Jordan Leavitt, which is scary. And then who beat me as a plus 310 underdog because the guy back, Daniel Zell Hoover, refused to engage him for three rounds. But I think this is a much better matchup for Trey Ogden than he's had in either of his first two UFC matchups, mostly because he's fighting a guy in Torres who is this pure early finisher archetype. We see these matchups a lot between UFC vets, guys who we know can fight for 15 minutes, and fighters who are on the come-up prospects, usually making their UFC debut, who typically finish opponents in the first round and have virtually no record of being extended in fights. And when these fighters get extended for the first time at the UFC level, typically they're at a cardio disadvantage and drop off in the later rounds. Now, we don't have a ton of information about Torres after the first round, but this is kind of the spot that I automatically back as long as I see an edge and I projected Ogden closer to plus 110. So as long as I see that edge, I'm happy to back this type of spot. UFC vet established has decent cardio against the guy whose cardio is unknown and is likely to be at a cardio disadvantage after the first round. Torres relies on getting submissions early. Ogden has pretty good submission defense. I actually think he's the better grappler here. So provided Ogden survives that first round, would look to lie better after round one. And I'll be happy to have my pre-fight money line ticket on him going into round two. So look to add more after round one on Ogden, but I think pre-fight he's worth making a bet on as well in the event that he wins that first round. Billy, underdog that you like for the weekend. Yeah, I really like Austin Lingo. He's somewhere in the plus 170, plus 180 range against Nate Landwehr. If anyone's watched a Nate Landwehr fight, he is far more interested in earning the fight of the night bonus than he is interested in winning the fight. You know, he comes out and brawls. He was about to finish David Onama, but instead of putting him away, he kind of danced around and played to the crowd and did all kinds of crazy stuff. But here's the thing. He's a brawler. I think Austin Lingo is going to engage in that too. He's got a little bit of that in him. But Landwehr has never landed a knockdown in the UFC. He doesn't have great power, where Lingo has scored knockdowns in both of his last two fights. So it's a pretty simple 
calculation for me here where if guys are just going to stand and trade and I know one of them can put the other one down and the other one probably can't, I'm going to take the guy with the better power because even if he gets outstruck, he lands that big one. He's got a shot at putting him away. You know, normally that's one where I then would like to bet the KO prop, but Landwehr seems to just be made out of iron and unable to die ever. You know, like no one can put him away despite really putting a lot of damage on him in his last few fights. So that's a little bit scary for me, but at plus 170, plus 180 range on the underdog, that's more than enough for me when a guy's got the power advantage in a fight. That's just going to be a war. They're not. There's not going to be much technique. You know, if you like jujitsu, you can skip this fight. These guys are just going to slug it out. Even uh, even the fin- even the times where he has been finished, Landwehr like immediately pops up and is protesting too. So yeah, it, it seems like you need to hit him with a literal anvil to knock him out. On to the fight of the night. Sean and Billy highlight a fight that they think deserves some extra attention and a fight they like to bet. And they've got Manel Cop taking on Alex Perez for the coming weekend. Why do we? Why does this one stand out to us, Zarillo? And how do we want to bet this one? Uh, really exciting flyweight matchup. I think these are two, I'd say two of the top five flyweights in the world. And I think either of them could justify themselves as a potential title challenger with a couple of wins. I'd say two more wins and the winner here will get a title shot. So win this matchup, win another fight and you'll be in a title matchup. Um, skill for skill. I think Alex Perez is the better fighter, but he has some durability issues. He tends to get submitted in his fights. I don't love how he reacts to taking damage. And Manel Cop hits very hard. Former Risen champion. We've seen his skill level up over time. His defensive grappling, I think, has improved. I don't think he's going to be able to stop takedowns from Perez here early necessarily, though. Perez, if he wants to put him on the mat, I think he can get him there. Cop does have some creative submission skills from his back. Uh, I threw up a couple of Kimuras in his last fight that almost got there um that's not a submission you typically see pulled off in the UFC at this stage but he's so strong he almost did it um so I I think this is a pretty binary fight where cop has more finishing upside he could get submitted too but I think he has vastly more finishing upside and I view Perez as the superior minute winner so I'm actually playing this fight from two different perspectives not something I normally do but I saw pretty clear value on cop inside the distance at around plus 120, plus 110, and then also Perez by decision at around plus 500. So what I did, plus 550, so what I did was put 0.3 units on cop inside the distance, 0.1 on Perez by decision. If either of those hit, I'll win about a quarter unit. Neither of those hit, I lose about a third of a unit. So playing both sides of this fight, I think that's the decent way to go about it. I know Billy's going to mention a live bet. The only reason I don't like it is that I think Cop will actually be dangerous for the duration of the fight. I think he will retain his knockout power for all three rounds. So I wouldn't want to add more on the Perez side and then just sort of overemphasize where I allocated my units in the fight and end up, you know, breaking even or losing. So that that structure that I built out, the Cop small inside the distance and then Perez smaller by decision is how I go about playing it. Six of Perez's last seven bouts have finished in round one. That is uh, remarkable stuff. But so, so essentially, you're you're hedging, yeah, out of the gate. Okay, yeah, I think you know, there's not that is, that often where I show value do. on two sides of a fight, and I end up playing both. Usually, I'll just pick one and sort of go with that. But I think this is a pretty binary angle where I could stand to profit a little bit on either side by poking both, and I'm comfortable losing a third of a unit. You know, trying to win a quarter on either side. Billy, cop first round, is that something you're looking towards because of Perez's struggles early on the last couple of fights? Yeah, you, obviously Zerillo and I are seeing this very similarly. I'm just taking a little bit bigger swing on round one versus inside the distance in general. The thing I noticed with Perez is he really likes to settle in there and, you know, we touch gloves, we step back, we kind of start going. And guys who come right out of the gate and just blitz him, give him a really, really hard time. He really doesn't like that. It's something I've seen and experienced myself where sometimes you kind of have this unspoken rhythm that we're going to step back, we're going to feel each other out, we're going to throw some jabs. And when guys break that, it can be very disorienting. It can be a big challenge. And that's happened a couple times to Prez. Both of his last two fights, he got pressured right out of the gate and did not respond well. If I'm cop, I've seen that. I'm going to charge forward right ahead. On the other hand, Prez has, you know, win by leg kicks, really good wrestling. Those are both things that build as the fight go on similar to what we talked to with Vera, but with the added bonus of wrestling. 
Zerillo touched on the submissions that cop throws up, which is great. You know, if you can get it to work, it's awesome. But when you don't tap the guy out, you're losing the round because he doesn't try to get back to his feet and strike again. He likes to play off his back, try to set up Kimura's primarily also some triangles and some other stuff, which is risky. So that's obviously the Prez by decision line. I included Prez live or by decision. I'm not so sure that I'm going to be watching this one live. So I'm going to go half a unit each on cop in round one and Prez by decision. So pretty much exact same thesis to Sean, just a little bit, a uh, little bit more aggressive with the cop round one. I don't see him getting a late finish because once Perez settles in there, he's going to pick up some leg kicks. He's going to tire him out with some grappling and that slows down cops power. You go to the prop market and we, we talked a lot about round one for that particular fight, cop and Perez Zarillo. There's a fight you're eyeing to bet live in the second and third rounds where you could see some potential value. Yeah, there's three different fights where I like fighters to win either in round two or round three. So I sprinkled all three of those. Billy already talked about the Nate Landwehr fight against Austin Lingo. I think Lingo and Landwehr is going to be extremely competitive for a round. And then I think Landwehr is going to drown him with cardio. Landwehr, a former college track athlete, doesn't have a lot of power, as Billy said, but he does put a pace on people and wear them down with his cardio and his pace. I actually also like Wayne Rare to win by submission in that matchup. We've seen him snatch up submissions in the past. I know Billy said there won't be jujitsu in that fight, but I actually could see him finishing that one via submission. He's done it in the past against Ludovic Klein in the UFC. He's plus 950 by sub for Landwehr there, I think is an interesting price, but plus 650 round two, plus 950 round three, in addition to a live bet after round one. And then a very similar angle, Tucker Lutz going against Pineda, and then CJ Vergara, going against potentially the fighter with the worst cardio in UFC history and Daniel Lacerda. Both of those fighters left the win in round two plus 500, round three plus 1,000, and then Vergara plus 500 and plus 1,200 respectively, sprinkling all to win in round two, all to win in round three, and then looking to live bet each of them after round one. I think all of their fights are going to be competitive for five minutes, and then each of them should take over to a significant degree with a cardio advantage. So we actually only need to hit one of those six props in order to break even on the three fights. Uh, and I feel pretty confident we're going to get two of them. Billy, where are you seeing value in the prop market? Yeah, I'm going much less aggressive than Zerillo on this one. I'm looking at cheating Nojakani, which I probably butchered the last name. Might be the hardest one this week. He's about a minus 170 favorite against Albert Durayev. But you can get him by knockout at plus 120 or inside the distance at plus 110 or so. I'm kind of okay with either. Durayev. I'll start with Chidi. Chidi has won his last four fights, including contender series and PFL, all by knockout. Ton of power, comes out aggressively. And we saw Durayev get pieced up pretty badly by Joaquin Buckley. Finally stopped because his eye swelled shut, but it probably could have been stopped a couple times before that. And Chidi is much bigger, much more powerful, much more reached than Buckley. Buckley's dropping to 170, right? So Chidi's a much bigger guy. It's one of those where if Chidi's going to win, it's almost certainly a knockout or inside the distance. I don't see Durayev having the durability to lose for 15 minutes. He's either going to win or get finished. So when you can get a guy at minus 170 who is most likely path of victory is plus 120, that feels like a pretty good one for me. Okay, as we normally do, we wrap with best bets. I will say in preface before we do that, that Billy and Sean think all of these bets are their best bets. Right, Sean? You no, know, none of these bets are my best bets this week. I really don't like that's this That's true. Party. You've mentioned a hedge and you've mentioned a few sprinkles. So that's, <laughs> yeah, that's fair. I, I have, uh, you know, normally I have about five and a half units risk on a UFC card. This week I have three and a half and I don't have more than a half unit on any fight. And lots of them are like 0.1 here, 0.1 there. So this is not a best bets card. This is not like a allocate a bunch of the money lines. This is take a lot of small shots, have fun with it. It's a Saturday night, a little bit to Jenny, but. At the same time, we're, we're going to search for those like plus 550 decision props. Hope to hit a couple and break even. Okay, so what's your best bet? <laughs> My best bet. And, you know, normally when I throw out an underdog. I After give all that, luck. we still have one. Yeah, we're going to go with Trey Ogden at plus 135. I just like the angle. This is a, the type of bet that I place on almost every card, which is UFC prospect going against an established UFC vet who's had at least a couple fights with proven cardio. And the prospect is an early finisher who is very likely to fade after the first round. So Ogden pre-fight to about plus 120. Ogden live after round one. 
And then in round robins, I may have Ogden's decision prop as well. I showed value on that prop. Don't necessarily know how Torres is going to look if this fight extends. So don't want to be banking on an Ogden decision, you know, with a pre-fight bet, but I'll throw it in a round robin and maybe it gets there. All right, Billy, take us home. Your best bet for UFC San Antonio. Yeah, I'm with Zerillo. It's really hard to pick out one of these. Like, I had an overall winning week last week, and then we tanked our best bet just because, you know, we like all these bets, right? Exactly. There's not one that necessarily is much better than the others. But, you know, gun to my head for this one, I'm going with Trevin Giles at minus 110, minus 115, depending on where you look. Really similar to what Zerillo was saying. He's fighting Preston Parsons, who only has two UFC fights. He's one and one, but his win was against a lightweight who stepped up on like three days notice. So in my book, Preston Parsons has never never really beat a UFC welterweight. Trevin Giles has been around a long time, had a little winning streak going, but he ran into Drickus Duplahis at 185, came back down to 170. His looked better. And it's a similar game where, you know, Preston Parsons, he's Preston pressure Parsons because he comes out so aggressively. I think Giles can wear him down. You know, been around a long time, should be the bigger, stronger guy. And Parsons hasn't had to fight bigger, stronger guys yet. So, you know, basically a coin flip. I'm willing to take Giles on that and make Parsons prove it against a UFC level guy, his own size. Okay, fellas. So it sounds to me like this is a card that you're not as uh, attracted to in other cards. No, some good fights from a viewing perspective, actually maybe even better than last week's pay-per-view in terms of an overall viewing perspective. But from a betting perspective, this is a difficult card like I said, though, those those round two, round three props, like I'm excited to bet those, you know, those plus 600s, plus 950s. I just don't have more than 0.1 unit on any of those bets. So across like seven different bets, I don't even have three quarters of a unit there. So that's, it's just a lot of small pokes this week, but hopefully we we cash some nice plus money tickets and maybe even a round robin heads. Yeah, I actually like cards like this a little bit better when we're taking a little bit longer shots. You kind of just need one to pay off your whole night. When you're betting guys at minus 180, minus 250, it's just terrifying. Like, it's no, it's no fun watching those. You know, we, uh, sweating out your plus 600 ticket, that's fun. We all like that. So Yeah, there's, there's no sweat period. Like, it's just pure enjoyment, you know, right. sweating out like a minus 140 money line that you drop two units on in an MMA fight. That's not the most enjoyable 15 minutes of your life. But, yes, not really sweating these plus 600s, rooting them on is actually pretty enjoyable. So It's a good reminder that bankroll management matters. And yes. uh, you don't have to go all in each and every No, week. I, you know, I, I lost the big bet last week on Fiziv. Like that was one of my biggest bets of the year. I was very confident in it. It was my best bet and I lost. Sometimes you have a very confident read and it loses. Sometimes you're not that confident and the bet wins. You know, it is a reminder potentially to keep your unit sizing similar, allocate all the same to most of your bets and don't fluctuate because you don't really know anything more than the market does in the long run. Like you, you may be betting into value, but the line is probably closer to accurate than you think it is. A good way to wrap up our UFC fight night, betting preview, San Antonio, at t center this coming weekend. Thanks for tuning in everybody here on the action network podcast. We are presented by FanDuel. As a reminder, we have our March madness player props episode coming your way for the final four next Thursday. That'll be out. Also, more college hoops over on the Big Bets on Campus podcast, the entire uh, college basketball crew weighing in during the tournament. So you have that to look forward to. Also, baseball. I think Sean Zarillo will be involved in this in some capacity. Monday and Tuesday of next week, we'll be releasing American League and National League best bets. Uh, also, more baseball on payoff pitch. So on the Action Network podcast, we have League specific best bets on this particular podcast next week, and then payoff pitch if you want more deep dives on baseball. That's coming your way with opening day less than a week away. Find more from Sean and Billy on the Action Network app, also the website. As I mentioned, Billy has his luck ratings out, so you can find uh, value for any UFC fight card and for this weekend in particular. Best of luck this weekend, everybody. We'll see you next time on the Action Network podcast. 